Please rise. Hear again the words written for us in Deuteronomy chapter 10. Fear the Lord your God. Serve him, cling to him, and take your oaths in his name. He is your glory. He is your God, who performed for you these great and awesome things that your own eyes have seen. Now may the God of hope fill you with complete joy and peace as you continue to believe, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You may be seated. Where I grew up, and in pretty much all of flyover country, this color represents pretty much one thing and one thing alone. Hunting. But then I moved out here, and now I know better. Whenever you see this color around the state or around the town, you know, well, there is someone who has some connection to the Oregon State Beavers. It could be a student, a graduate, an alum, a researcher, someone on staff, or just a Corvallisite. Corvallisonian? Like many of you who are sitting here. Whether the team is having a great season, a mediocre season, or even a poor season, everyone is happy to display their colors. We glory to be connected to the team. We are happy when we are connected to something bigger than ourselves. Israel, as we see in our lesson today, was connected to God himself. God made them his people. So how were they going to show their pride and glory in what God had done? It's not like they could wave God flags or put on some sort of God-colored clothing to match. How were they going to show? And so as Moses continued his farewell speech, he told them, he told them, the Lord your God is your glory. And we share in that very same blessing. You see, this place isn't your alma mater. You have more than some passing connection to the Lord. And the joy you receive is far greater than any victory you can have on the field or in the court. Therefore, today we glory in God's gracious choice. Deuteronomy is Moses' farewell address, but it is also a reminder of the agreement between God and his people. At this point, we are ten chapters in to Moses' preamble. That is, a review of all the history between God and his people, all the things that God has done, all the reasons they have to keep this agreement, and why this agreement is necessary for them and their good. God called them when they were just one childless couple. God multiplied them and he blessed them. God brought them out of Egypt. He split the sea and he would deliver a good land into their hands. They weren't the most numerous nation on earth. They weren't glorious. They didn't have any real wealth or power. They weren't innovators or philosophers. They had nothing. But the Lord was their God. So, now, Israel, what is the Lord your God asking of you? And then Moses points God's people to the first, the greatest commandment, but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. That is, to serve the Lord with everything that you are. And to keep the commandments and the statutes that I am commanding you to this day for your own good. Those are simple words. But they are not so easy to follow. The sinful heart is always growing attached to the things which aren't 
God. And like children, we do not always choose to follow and to do those things that are for our own good. And so though Moses is clearly instructing the Israelites on the basics of the law, to fear, love, and trust in God above all things, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself, the commands and statutes that God was giving them were more than that. They were all the laws that were to govern the nation of Israel. They were all the ceremonial laws that would tell them how to worship the Lord Walk in all of his ways, especially in a sinful and dangerous world. That was not going to be an easy task. It was not going to be an easy task. But for them, it should have been a no-brainer. Moses continues, Indeed, the heavens, that is, the highest heights of the earth, the place where the eagles soar and the clouds float, the atmosphere, and you might even include the stars that you could see in the sky, the heavens, and the heaven of heavens, that is, all the spiritual realms, the earth, and everything that is on it, these belong to the Lord your God. That is, all things in existence, all things in the universe, all things belong to the Lord. He created them. He governs and rules over them. He controls them. In him all things hold together. Nothing is outside of the Lord's power and his influence. Everything on earth displays his wisdom. Each part of creation proclaims his glory. And so while people fashion gods for themselves, mute idols who cannot hear their prayers and cannot do anything to help, demons may boast about their little spheres of influence and they deceive people into thinking that they might even be true gods who can help them. People may carve out little fiefdoms for themselves, places where they think that they are in control and they have all the power from a president who can proudly don the title of leader of the free world, to local rulers and mayors, to business owners, to simply the people who go to their own home and look at their own four walls and say, a man's home is his castle. People want a place where they can say, I am the Lord or lady, but the Lord. The Lord, your God, is God of gods and Lord of lords. The great God, the mighty one, the awesome one, that is who God is. There is only one God and no other God or idol compares to him. No other power on earth even comes close to his glory. And no matter what Israel had already seen the Lord do with the power of his own hand, no matter what they had seen with their own eyes, they had only seen the tiniest part of God's glory. Still, the Lord your God attached himself to your fathers, loved them, and he chose their descendants after them, even you. And he chose them from all the peoples of all the earth as it is today. When coaches go around the country, they try to select the best athletes. And then they tell those athletes about the wonders of their program and what glory that player can achieve with them. They offer them scholarships to join their team. Because a coach knows he can only win when he has good players. Recruiters go out to college fairs. They set up their booths and they describe all the different programs that their college has to offer. And they tell those high school seniors what career paths may lie ahead of them if they only choose to go to our school. And then 
the admissions department sorts through all those applications and they choose only those people that they deem worthy, the most qualified, those with the best grades, the most dedicated to go to their institutions. You see, as much as good students need good colleges, good colleges also need good students. Well, what does God need with Israel? Or with Abraham? Did God need the challenge of the scheming Jacob and his 12 rebellious sons? What did a nation of slaves have to offer God? The God of gods and the Lord of all lords. And we, what do you have to offer the Lord that he cannot get for himself? Does God need me for his voice to be heard? Is he impressed by your wisdom and your accomplishments that he just has to have you on his team? Is there anyone who can offer God anything so that they are worthy, so that they deserve any hint, any peace, any slice of God's attention, his love, or his glory? And yet, yet God came down to deliver Israel from Egypt the Egyptian idols were powerless against his might. Pharaoh's army drowned in the heart of the sea. God, the Lord, led his people through the wilderness. The Lord forgave their complaining and provided for all their needs. The Lord, their God, would deliver to them the promised land. And for us, yet the Lord of lords has come down from heaven to be born in a manger. The one who owns the heavens and the earth made himself nothing, taking on the form of a servant. King David's Lord became King David's son to fulfill God's word. Though he was rich and all things belonged to him, he became poor so that by his poverty you might become rich. And all who hear his voice, all who call on his name, all who believe in his work, they are saved. My friends, the God over all has chosen you. The God over all has called you. And he has say, made it so that you are more than just his people. The Lord of lords is pleased to call you children of God. That is the glory of God's gracious choice. This God, the only true God, has come down to live, to die, to rise, to defeat Satan, to take away your sins and all their punishment, to conquer death, to save you. And so now, Moses says, now that God has made his choice, now that God has come down to save you, so that now that God has shown you all that he is and all that he can do, what else can we do but serve him? So circumcise the foreskin of your hearts, therefore, and do not stiffen your necks. We don't often talk about circumcision. Probably for good reason. It's not a comfortable topic to talk about. But for God's people, they knew all about circumcision. Every Israelite male, from the time God confirmed his covenant with Abraham, all through the time of Jesus, they had to be circumcised cutting some skin off the body, which was to be a reminder to them 
that God promised to save them through the seed of a woman, through the seed of Abraham, that was only part of what God wanted from his people. This was only an outward sign of what God desired to work within them so that David would pray, Create in me a new heart. And God would promise Ezekiel, I will take away their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. But of course, the Israelites, they couldn't see into the heart. They couldn't see the heart or work on the heart or slice off a little piece of the heart. This circumcision of the heart, it cannot be a work of our hands. This is a work only of God's grace. God created the world in six days. On the seventh day, he rested. And on the eighth day, human history truly begins. When God commanded circumcision to Abraham, it was that all male babies were to be circumcised on the eighth day. This was also the day that they would be named. So that all of God's people would, un- be, would know that God had a new member of the household of faith. On the eighth day, God welcomed that child as a member of his covenant people. In Holy Week, the pa- perfect Passover lamb, Jesus, was sacrificed. On the Sabbath day, he rested. And on the eighth day, Christ rose. And the covenant of circumcision was fulfilled in him. The seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, had crushed the serpent's head. And on the eighth day, the covenant of grace began. My friends, your eighth day is the day of your baptism. Because in your baptism, you are baptized into Christ Jesus. You are baptized into his death so that your old sinful flesh may be cut off. So that your old man, that old sinful nature, will be buried with Christ. So that your heart of stone will be broken. And you may rise on that eighth day to live a new life. And the rest of your life, your new life with Christ, begins. And so now, each day, now that you have been baptized, each day you rise on that eighth day to live a new day with Christ. You live a life given back to you. You live as one of God's people. You live with a new, clean heart, a pure heart, a heart which, in which God himself is pleased to dwell. You live putting away that old sinful nature. Your heart is made clean. This is your glory. This is to God's praise. The God of gods, the Redeemer of Israel, the Lord of lords who died for your sins, he has chosen to dwell in your hearts by faith. After a glorious victory, the fans deck themselves out in the team's colors. After a disappointing defeat, they don those colors to show their support. Because we know that you don't, when you're a fan of a team, you're a fan in the good and the bad. At the same time, sports are just the smallest part of what a university is all about. And wearing a team's colors is about the least impactful way to show your pride and make your university proud. A graduate can be proud that they went to their school when they get on the job and start using what they were taught. The best endorsement of a, co- a college can have isn't a winning team, but what their graduates have to offer the workforce and the world. We often wear crosses. You could put on one of our beautiful Savior t-shirts or another shirt that proclaims that you that has a Christian message or Christian logo on it and then everyone who sees you would know you call yourself a Christian. 
But Moses told God's people, and he tells you today, the best way, the only real way to glory in God's gracious choice is in the way that you live your life. To live as God's people who have been taught by God himself how they are to love. Moses says, The God of gods and the Lord of lords, the awesome one and the mighty one, he does not show favoritism and he does not take a bribe. He carries out justice for the fatherless and the widow. He loves the alien who dwells among you and gives him food and clothing. God's love for all people has no exclusions. He loves everyone who falls through the cracks of society. He sees those from whom everyone else averts their eyes. He protects those whom the world discards. He tells his people, so also you are to love the alien because you were aliens in Egypt. My friends, we cannot fail to notice just how much God has given us. Indeed, it seems like we are living in a time of victory and prosperity. In addition to his forgiveness and all the spiritual blessings that go with his grace, he has given us great abundance beyond all measure. But our glory cannot be in these things. Our confidence is not in these things. We cannot be afraid to lose all these things. Because even when we do not have them, when the sorrows of this world pile up against us, when we feel defeated, we cannot lose the glory that God gives us. Because our glory cannot be in our success or our thoughts or in our abilities. No, the Lord of lords, the God of gods, he is your glory. And we can show that in what we do. You show that in who you are, what God has done, with what we prioritize in our lives, in our generosity, in our boldness, in our joy, in our confidence, in our suffering. You put on your team colors and rejoice in God's gracious gift. So Moses says, fear the Lord your God, serve him, and cling to him. Make your oaths in his name. Live as people chosen, blessed, and kept, and loved by the God of gods and the Lord of lords. Lived as the Lord's redeemed. And in this way, you truly glory in God's gracious choice. Amen. Please rise. And now the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. We join now in confessing our